For those of us that want to leave a dent on this planet, success is a daily thought, a constant struggle, and a consistent commitment. The good part is, success leaves clues. There are rules to follow if you want to be successful, and we identify those rules for you. Welcome to the Rules of Success interview series, where we converse with experts, mentors, high-level achievers in all industries, laying out for you the rules of success. Now here's your host, Bryce Prescott. We are back. Another interview series episode for you. This is the first one we've had in several months, and I'm excited because it's a great one. James Garrett of Brain by Design joined us in the studio for an amazing conversation about behavioral science, what's going on with your brain. Today's rule is one that he shares with us specific to habit forming and how it applies to repetition and the science of it. Here we go. Here's today's rule. Habits are like the invisible architecture of our lives. So if you can master the science or the skill set of forming habits in your life, essentially you're mastering your own behavior and what and your own outcomes in your life. But what's fascinating about the science around habit formation, you drive along that, that same path again and again, eventually you'll start laying down tire tracks, eventually you'll drive it enough, you'll sort of smooth it out to become a dirt road, and finally your brain's going to be like, wow, let's, let's throw some resources at this thing, let's pave that thing, right? And if you keep doing it, if you keep doing that behavior or action, eventually it'll be a five lane freeway. On a personal level, I have been on a kick to understand habit and the formation of habit for the past several months. It's something that I've noticed kind of is an offline observation, but I wanted to dive into the science of it. And fortunately, I was able to meet James a couple months ago. We're a part of the same mastermind group, and he blew me away with his level of expertise and knowledge specific to the scientific side of habit creation, basically what is exactly happening inside your brain when you are trying to improve and trying to expand your capacity, your knowledge, your creativity, your intelligence, all those things. Smart, smart guy. Let me give you some info that's uh, right from his bio so you can get a, a better idea about who James Garrett is. For over a decade, James has been studying and teaching the psychology of success. And as he calls it, unpacking the brain science behind what makes human beings thrive. He's an entrepreneur, he's a scientist, he's a coach, and he is passionate about turning what scientists know about the brain into practical tools that we can use to change our lives. Not only is he the founder of Brain by Design, which you can find at brainbydesign.com, he was the co-founder and co-executive director of Think Unlimited, which was a nonprofit organization that was established that did charitable work and teaching in Jordan, in the Middle East. He tells us all about that in our interview. Basically, James is one of those guys that uh, comes from academia, but yet is an entrepreneur at heart. And he's been able to combine those two schools to really introduce some great science behind expansion. And what we talk about today in this interview is his backstory, where he came from as far as his, his upbringing and, and how he got into being in that space of studying brain science and, and behavior. We talk about how to restructure belief systems based off of systems. We talk about how we are just all together travelers in this journey. Anyway, I'm going to shut up. I want you guys to hear directly from James. James Garrett of Brain by Design on the other side of our sponsors. See you there. This episode of Rules of Success is brought to you in part by The Annex. How many of you listening understand how important community and support is to your ultimate success? As the name suggests, The Annex is an additional place of learning and support for Rules of Success listeners. As a private Facebook community, your membership to The Annex provides you a forum for daily coaching, inspired content, and the association of other success-minded, truth-seeking individuals. To see if you'd be a fit for The Annex and to download a free expansion blueprint to assist you to get clear on your goals, visit jointheannex.com. That's J-O-I-N-T-H-E-A-N-N-E-X.com. This episode of Rules of Success is also brought to you in part by Gnarly Nutrition. It could be argued that diet and supplementation are actually more important to a fit, healthy body than actual exercise. That's where Gnarly Nutrition steps in. With products that include BCAAs, whey protein, pre-workout powders, and meal replacements, Gnarly is committed to providing clean sports nutrition, period. 
You can be confident that gnarly nutrition products are blended with only superior, organic, non-GMO ingredients. With gnarly, it's natural, healthy, and delicious. Go check out gonarly.com to get your stash. All right, my friends, we are back. This is the first interview series episode of Rules of Success in a couple months, and I'm really thankful for my friend James Garrett's willingness to come here in studio and have a powerful conversation about something that's been very interesting to me over the years. And uh, when I met James a couple months ago, um, I actually, we were part of the same mastermind group. And uh, I, I immediately pinned him down after our first call. I'm like, I got to talk to this guy. Because, uh, you know, the science and technology associated with your brain and uh, habits and different things was something that was very, very peculiar to me. So first and foremost, thank you, James, for coming in studio. I'm excited to highlight you and your work and the things that you've done. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you, Bryce. Really, really appreciate you having me. Absolutely, man. So... Um, there's a couple things that I want to get into before. We're going to talk about your past and some of the different things that led up to you being a legit scientist and coach mm. and uh, somebody that has decided to make a career off of focusing on the brain. Mm. But before we get into that, I wanted to give you a chance. Give me your elevator pitch for exactly what Brain by Design is. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Brain by Design is a platform, uh, essentially a training platform uh, for people to um, learn how to harness their mind and brain in a way that gets their brain basically working for them instead of against them. Um, nice. One, one way I like to think about it is that uh, your brain comes with a lot of sort of default programs, if, if I can call them that. And Brain by Design is really learning the skill of how to upgrade those programs to sort of a 2.0 version. Nice. And, uh, and learning how to become that sort of designer or programmer in your own life so you're upgrading your default. operating system within brain by design for your that's right okay that's right excellent so i'm gonna have to wait because just the idea of going down that route is, is <laughs> really really cool i mean just as i want to plant some seeds for the sure. future as we talk about this so if you're listening to this we're going to talk about what exactly that voice in your head really is mm. and uh, the different things that both help and hinder your capacity to uh, create change Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, let's let's talk about your backstory here a little bit because uh, you, when when I first met you, you were telling the story of how you had lived in Jordan in mm -hmm. the Middle East, and you mm -hmm. were a part of a nonprofit over there, and it was such a fascinating deal. I I want to focus on that for a little bit, but before we do, I want to talk about Little James, the yeah. guy, the guy that grew up, because you you obviously have a very uh, interesting pursuit. You've spent time all over the world. Um, you're very very well versed, and you know have all the initials behind your name, so to speak, when it comes to this uh, psychology stuff and, and science of the brain. Um, what was it about your childhood that allowed that to kind of come to fruition? Give me, give me some specifics about the conditions and circumstances that surrounded your childhood and you being a scientist. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. Um, so I grew up in a big family. Uh, I'm the third of 10 kids. Wow. And uh, I, I grew up actually mostly doing music. Music was actually a, a singing and, and, and playing piano and those types of things. My mom was a voice teacher. Um, and, and I had a pretty, pretty, I would say, kind of typical suburban middle class upbringing. Okay. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Salt Lake City. And, um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I like when I look back at my life, it seems kind of vanilla, actually. Right? I, I, I don't. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't really. Um, I wasn't really a born entrepreneur, right? And I, I didn't. I don't feel like I. I don't have that story, right? Sure. I was. I sort of grew into entrepreneurship and, and science, actually. Um, I actually didn't grow up around a lot of. Um, uh, we didn't have a lot of books in my house, nonfiction books, right? We had we had some books, um, but I didn't. I my my parents weren't. Um, uh, I, I didn't grow up around scholars or, or a professor or something that naturally sort of predisposed me, I guess, to to brain science or, or sort of just research in general. Um, and that that part of my story, I guess, sort of grew up a little bit later. Um, I, I I guess when I was young, I, I'd always. I'd always been attracted to, I guess, uh, hard questions. Sure. 
um, I'd always been sort of troubled by by uh, uh, you know the the fact that there was so much pain and, and kind of suffering in the world, I guess. And, um, and and I asked a lot of why, right? Why? Why? Like why would that? I talked my grandma, my grandma, my mom, my dad's mother uh, was was a sort of self made intellectual, and she and I would have a lot of conversations about these things. And um, it really wasn't until university, actually, that I kind of stumbled, and I would say stumbled, I kind of stumbled into psychology uh, and and really uh, fell in love with it. It was really in my college years, I think, that I fell in love with science. And then in going to Jordan and, and, and starting what we were doing there, when I, that I fell in love with entrepreneurship. I love it. There's one thing that uh, I heard from you that is is a quite appropriate um considering the timing of you saying this, that you grew up in a house where music was a big part of your pursuit. Um, yeah. You know, singing and playing, and and, uh, and I don't know the specifics of exactly what you're doing, but I, I know for a fact that I, too, grew up in a home where I was constantly engaged in that. I play, mm. I play several musical instruments myself, and, mm. and uh, it's I'm, I'm, I feel very blessed that, that was a part of my childhood. Yeah. I actually recently just released an episode of Rules of Success talking about the connection between expanded intel- intelligence and creativity. Hmm. And so knowing you're one of the smartest guys I know, it's no surprise to me that there's actually music in your background. Like that seems to be a you're tell kind. when it comes to be like specific, you know, levels of understanding. Like music, it's crazy how music makes an yeah. appearance in a lot of the lives of, of highly intellectual people. It is interesting. There's an interesting connection there. And I... I'm less familiar with the research on this, but there is people have done good some some good research on this. I know. Yeah, excellent. So let's talk about. Uh, so you're saying it was in in your college years that you you somewhat uh, started to feel a spark towards psychology, and that 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 inherently led to Jordan, your experience there, and that's where your entrepreneurship was born. Is that is that fair? Yeah. So so the science. So so I kind of. Um, so I split my undergrad two different places. I started out at BYU um, uh, and took a general psychology class. Was actually majoring in music and then started taking some psychology courses on the side. Um, and by the time I got about halfway into my undergrad, I was kind of split half psychology and half music. Uh, and I, was, I got so fascinated actually by positive psychology and the positive psychology movement. Um, and just in general, the research that was going on at, at universities um, outside out of what was my home state, uh, that I really, I wanted to, I wanted to like go all in, right? I wanted to like work with these, these big, prof- you know, these, what to me at the time felt like these big name professors. And, um, and so I just applied. My, my, I had a brother in New York at the time who was also... Uh, who was going to Columbia. And so he and I were talking back and forth about the possibility of applying to where he already was. So I applied to two different schools. I got into Columbia and and I transferred. Um, And so I basically split my undergrad in half. And once I got to New York, um, I dove in like head first. I was in like two or three different research labs. Um, and, And again, just sort of stumbled into what for me was a big deal. I started working... Uh, in Walter Michelle's lab. Walter Michelle is uh, the psychologist who did the famous marshmallow studies um, with delay of gratification and self-control. Um, Can you met, give us a, a brief synopsis of what that means. Was um, it the one where like they sit like a donut in a room and said, you know, if you can wait, you can have more. Anyway. I'm, you got it. You got it. Yeah, yeah. So they would sit down, these poor kids, right? They, <laughs> they would sit down, these poor kids. They, originally, these were done at Stanford and then they also did a round of them at uh, Columbia. Uh, but Walter, when he, when he was at Stanford being nursery, basically he would bring kids into a room. Um, I'm pretty sure the ages were six to eight, six, I think that's right. He'd sit them in a room and say, um, you know, here, with, with, with a marshmallow on a plate and say, here, here are, here's one marshmallow. You know, if you can wait until the experimenter comes back. Uh, you can have two marshmallows, but it's your choice. You know, if you want to eat one marshmallow now, that's okay. Right. Here's a bell. You know, if you, if you really want the experimenter to come, if you want the person to come back, then ring the bell and they'll come back and you, and you can just eat the one marshmallow. But if you wait until they come back, you know, then, then you can have two. Cruel and unusual Cruel, right? punishment. Painful. <laughs> so they didn't really know what would happen on, on these experiments when they did them. Uh, 
but what they ended up starting to do is track the kids over time. Okay. Were you a part of this at all, being it was the same lab? Did you get a, a piece of any of this Yeah, so research? I was involved in, in that sort of collection of that long, what they call longitudinal data, that data that gets tracked over time many, many sure. years. And, um, and I was involved in sort of coding the video, videos or, or transferring the videos. I mean, I, like, you know, I'm a lowly RA, so I, I'm like taking the videos, the VHS tapes of those poor kids, like biting their fingers and like pulling their <laughs> hair out, right? It, uh, from VHS to DVD. I'm, and I'm doing these types of things. And I'm also working with some of their grad students designing new experiments because these were, of course, the foundation, as with any lab. These are the foundation studies, and then they've done hundreds and hundreds of other studies, sure. uh, which is where some of the studies I was working on. Um, but anyway, so they tracked these these kids over time, and what they what they ended up starting to find was that the ability to delay gratification when you're six or seven has these sort of dramatic outcomes or implications for your life when you're, you know, a teenager, a young adult, a, a mid middle aged adult. Uh, they started finding that kids who could do that when they were young had higher SAT scores, uh, were getting better grades, um, were in more stable relationships once they had a serious relationship, um, were making more money. Um, all these life outcomes, you know, that were not just not just uh, uh, making more money, but they were happier, right? They're on, on, on almost every level. Uh, they had what we would consider a, a better life or, or a sort of uh, happier, more productive, successful life than the kids who, who weren't able to delay gratification. And so well, anyway, Walter, Michelle started theorizing about the, the self-control is this kind of master aptitude, that, it, that it's kind of the, the kind of core virtue around with which other virtues are built. Uh, and that if you can really grow and build that in kids or, and or adults, because it's a learnable skill at, at basically any age, sure. uh, that the implications are dramatic. Is there a tell in adulthood for those that uh, are good at delaying gratification that their lives are, are more successful? Is that is, is that because I, I, I think about, you know, as I'm listening to what you're saying in, in your yeah. story, I think about my daughter, right? She's sure. seven years old. Mm. She's highly intelligent, very, mm. very good at communication, very ambitious, has no fear with communicating. She knows exactly how to get what she wants, mm. but she cannot wait for anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I still know sure. that she will live a successful life in some sure. capacity. And sure. so, and then I look at myself and in my childhood, I, I didn't ever really have a choice to get what I wanted. It was kind of like this forced delayed gratification through poverty and through different things that were there. Interesting. And I know that that had created for me a scenario where I became for a, a large part of my adult life quite ostentatious in my expression of wealth when mm. things were, when, you know, in my former real estate business, I, I had the massive house and I had the big, the fancy cars and mm. stuff. And it was, it was almost like this, see, I told you type of, of mm. internal struggle that I dealt with. And so seeing and, and just somewhat juxtapositioning those two things against each other when it comes to a seven-year-old in a Columbia research room waiting mm. to eat a, a marshmallow. Yeah. I wonder if there's other tells along the way that, uh, anyway, just a, a curious thought is all. Yeah, there, there almost certainly are. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look back at the research more carefully. I, I'm guessing there has been other studies that have been done on, on more and older adult populations, but I'm, I'm less familiar with those. Well, let's, let's, I want to hear about your, your uh, position that took you to Jordan and sure. uh, share with us about that nonprofit, what you were doing there. And, and I, I do know sure. from being a, a friend of yours that the seeds for Brain by Design were, were harvested there and uh, yeah. it ended up producing what you have here now back in the state. So, so what caused you to go to Jordan and why were you there? Yeah. Um, so after I finished my undergrad in New York, um, I met my wife at the time, the tail end of my undergrad, and we got married. Um, and then we moved to Boston, spent three years in Boston. And I was working in, an, in a research lab again uh, at Tufts University. And she was first doing research um, uh, on a big book project. She's sort of an ethnographer, anthropologist by training, and then was working in a nonprofit organization after that. She's had her foot more in the nonprofit world, or had it up until that point, more than I had. Um, but we had, um, we both, 
kind of felt fluid in both worlds, right? It was sort of like we had a love for this. We were both social science types and loved the research and the rigor and the and the questions and the life of the mind and that whole experience of academia. Um, but also could see this kind of gap between what social scientists knew and, and kind of what actually happened day to day with people who are on the front line of, of really challenging social issues, right? Whether those are in, whether that's in the nonprofit sector or in public policy or in education or even business, right? Um, those worlds don't always talk to each other. Right. You know, what we know, what academics know, um, doesn't always get into the way we design policy or the way, the best practices that nonprofits uh, undertake. Um, and so there was, there's a gap there that for me was troubling um, because it felt like, oh my gosh, there's a mountain, a world of science. And again, for me, it's sort of the brain and behavioral sciences that feel, it feels kind of like a, like, a, like a crime or a tragedy, like, like it's just stuck, like it's stuck in universities and in scientific journals. Uh, and then academics go to conferences and tell each other about their findings. And then they all go home and, and keep doing more research. And then you have these people, again, who are out in the world trying to make a difference in a variety of ways. Uh, and, and again, there's a gap there. The, the worlds aren't necessarily connecting. So, so would you say that gap is the difference between knowledge and finding knowledge and application of knowledge? Absolutely. That's right. Okay. Knowing and doing. And, and, and having sort of a... Um, some, I guess some level of rigor as you're going out and trying to do good in the world or make a difference in the world, that there's some, that it's informed, I guess, in some sense by, by good data or, or, or good science. Um, I, I strongly believe that that is a, a, it's a constructive way to, um, to try to get out and, and, and make a difference. Um, so, so, so that's really why we, so what we ended up doing was deciding to join Peace Corps. Um, and we didn't know where we'd end up. We actually did, had no idea that we'd end up in the Middle East. Um, and, but that's where they sent us. There's only two programs in the Middle East, Morocco and Jordan, and, and they ended up, that's where we got placed. And so you have a choice whether to accept or, or not that placement. Um, and we decided to go for it. Um, and uh, in our first two months, I mean, they, God, Peace Corps just kind of throws you in, right? The, the awesome <laughs> thing about the Peace Corps program is it's a full immersion experience. We were up in a little, you know, three to 4,000 person village up, up uh, in the northern part of Jordan, right? Pretty close to the Syrian border. And um, no Arabic, right? We don't know any right. Arabic. We're sitting, we're, we're staying in the home of a Jordanian family in this t very, very small town, village. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's actually only two families in this entire 4,000 person town. So to, to try to imagine your kind of extended family, uh, the, the Prescott clan, you know, right. uh, tribe that, that, that keeps going and going and going, third, fourth, fifth cousins and, and all the way down, uh, that you all just live together. You are the city, you are the town, you are the village, right? And um, that's, that's, you know, in, in, in outside of the capital of Amman, uh, and even inside the capital, you see a little bit of that, but, but certainly outside in more rural areas. This is very, very common how social, how the social kind of arrangement is. So anyway, so we're sitting down on like, you know, uh, what they call farshas, which are, farshas, which are like, like essentially the Arab style couches that are on the floor, right? Sure. And we're trying to communicate and we're pointing and we're, you know, they're, they're just keep, <laughs> they just keep putting food in front of us, trying to be generous and hospitable, which is, which is, so, they were so generous and kind with us. And, uh, and we're smiling and we're embarrassed and they're bringing their friends over. And we're, I mean, we're like, a, we're like the craziest thing that's happened to the place that we were at for years right it was crazy these were these this sort of strange looking americans uh you know in training and we're learning arabic right we had this sort of two-month training period sure um so we do that uh and then at, after our two months from there we 
we spent the next two years um, uh, in, a, in more of a mid-sized city, uh, closer to the capital, and uh, and we're working in education. I was working at an after-school uh, boys' youth center. My wife was working at a girls' government, a government girls' school. What were you teaching? So for me, it was a variety of things, youth programming, essentially, um, anything from sports to... Were you to teaching in Arabic or in... English. Oh, in English. Okay. Um, a little of both, actually. What I mean is some, some of the things we were doing were English courses, right? Sure. Um, um, and what ended up happening is we... We had sort of spent enough time in the in the public school system and in people's homes and and really just trying to absorb and learn uh, uh, what we could, you know, as outsiders. Um, and it became clear to us that the educational experience of most young people uh, in the country was was static right that there is basically a fact-based kind of rote memorization system teaching to the test uh we have similar kinds of problems it feels like we're sliding backwards in some ways here in the states uh and and we just wanted to see what we could do about that right is there a way to infuse the experience of the students we were working with every day with um joy and fascination and can we make learning exciting can you make it Engaging, and then that grew into: Can we start actually starting to build? Can we start building the skill sets, the kind of fundamentals of creativity and critical thinking and innovation? Can you teach innovation? Right? Can you can you kind of scaffold a student through a process where they're kind of building a step by step skill set that helps them think outside the box and helps them think more divergently, and and they start absorbing the mindsets and attitudes where they can see themselves as as going out and doing something in the world as building something as creating something right whether that's a company or a, an organization or, or just something small an initiative in their community so you're you're there doing that and you're seeing these these different uh, dare i say uh i don't know if it's the right word but almost archaic mindsets ways of thinking that are very linear it's it's uh it's almost survival based it would seem that these these communities aren't very progressive in their their thinking it's 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 what you know and 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 you're building these programs to help them to expand out of out of that mode of thinking into something else um am i close is that yeah i mean i would it, it these these conversations are always so nuanced um i i would i would describe it as um there was there's a lot of value placed on knowledge acquisition sure and handing that knowledge down from generation to generation got it and that you get rewarded for memorizing and and sort of um absorbing that body of knowledge if you will um and th and again things like entrepreneurship or um innovation were risky they're things parents don't understand um all the while on the on in the sort of leadership of the country you have tons of energy and investment trying to push that side of what's happening in a sure. country like jordan so share with me then an experience where you noticed um one of those fixed type of mindsets shift either in yourself or in one of your students yeah I, the details i'm trying to try to remember the details we had this student named, named khaled and um one of the modules so i'm fast forwarding quite a bit now because we spent two years as peace corps volunteers and then four years building a nonprofit organization called think unlimited we came back to the states for a few months founded that and then went back and then spent four more years so you were there for a total of six years? Um, total of almost six years. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and by the end of our Peace Corps service, we'd build a full curriculum for high school students, uh, both a summer sort of intensive experience and, and an after-school program. And then in our first year of operations as a nonprofit, that was the program we were running. And then we spent a year building a new program and started working with university students for the last uh part of our time as an organization um one of the modules uh we were working with uh was was simply empathy right building building this skill set of perspective taking and 
um, learning how to understand what it feels like to, to, to literally stand in, in the shoes of another person. And, uh, and we had this student uh, who was, for, for the community came from, was, would, did something very, very, uh, what I've considered very courageous, uh, Muslim student. Um, and uh, he decided he wanted to go visit um, uh, a, a Christian church, right? And, and just basically hang out and try to understand what it was like to be in a, in a totally different religious experience, which he was totally um, foreign to what he had experienced. I can imagine. And, and, and fairly weird, right? Right. So, so when he decides to do this, that's what I mean by courageous, right? He just was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And he's a fairly timid guy to begin with. And, uh, and he does. He goes and hangs out with, uh, with uh, I, believe it was a, I believe it was a Catholic uh, church. And, um, and he just spends the day with this, essentially with this pastor. And, and, and he says, you know, what, what can I do? What are you doing? And so the... the, the <laughs> The pastor helps him or has him work on. He's just he's like fixing chairs in the church, and so this is essentially like a some sort of service, right? Sure. So we're just working together sure. on this joint project, and uh, um, he comes back after that experience, and, and we're having them work, walk through, interviewing them, uh, you know, uh, trying to imagine again all these activities and exercises trying to really get them to experience what it's like to be in the shoes of another person and he came back and i still can't i almost still can't believe these are the words that came out of his mouth but he came back and he looked us straight in the eyes and we go so Khalid, like what did you learn like what was the experience like and he goes he looks straight in the eye and goes they're just like us <laughs> They're just like us, right? It just like, boom, just hit him. You know, this minority religious population, about 5% of the, you know, population is, is Christian in, 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 in Jordan. So it's a, uh, a Muslim majority nation. And um, it had never really occurred to him that, that the same concerns, right, about right. about day to day stuff, about about dad losing his job, and about about whatever whatever kind of daily stuff we all struggle with, that people who are from a different group than him have the very same concerns and problems and issues that he had, right? And that was a massive insight for him, uh, and, and pretty powerful. I heard the I heard it called at one point that it's uh, how did how was it said? It's difficult. To hate up close mm. and uh, when you look at the state of affairs in our world right now it seems that we're hating from a distance very easily but when you get close it's a lot more difficult to make those same decisions that yeah. uh, alienate you from another group and so hearing the story of your your friend there and in, in jordan and in his experience with a christian community and being a muslim that's that's really powerful you don't usually hear it in that order it's usually uh it has a different outcome. So it's, 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 it's great to even take an entrepreneurial look of shifting a mindset from fixed to growth hmm. under the context of what you shared with, you said his name was Khaled. Khaled. Khaled, okay. yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it just, it's, it's, it's inspiring and instills hope. Yeah. You know, we're, yeah. we're all just travelers in this journey as humans. Yeah. Sometimes we wear different clothes. Sometimes we have different thoughts, and uh, our beliefs are all up for grabs. So, um, which is a, a, another you know segue into your experience as as uh, you know the founder of Brain by Design and what you're doing because mm. these little computers we have between our ears incredibly powerful to create our reality both mm. literally and perceptually, and uh, it's kind of a, a beautiful thing to hear your story of how you saw that firsthand in these small, dare I say, cut off communities from, you know, a globalist perspective that mm. it's, there's just these tiny little t towns and not a lot of communication. You're there as a volunteer to teach and help and reaching people. So um, the next question I have for you is specific to your, the people that have influenced you, your mentors, your coaches, who have, who have you been 
close to or studied with or read or been coached by that has, has really made an impact on both your core principles as a person, as a man, mm-hmm. as well as your philosophy? So, so I had a lot of really amazing mentors uh, through my university and post-university experience in research. Um, uh, you know, Walter Michelle, Tori Higgins, uh, Geraldine Downey, Eshkel Raffaelli. Um, these were folks at Columbia that I worked with and um, uh, all, all sort of shaped my worldview as a scientist. Um, and, and then the biggest one is Nalani Ambadi, who I worked with at Tufts University in Boston for two years as her lab manager. And she passed away about a, a, a little while ago. And um, she, uh, amazing professor, and um, did a lot of work on snap judgments and first impressions. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks a little bit about her work in his book, Blink. Oh, okay. Um, and um, these are the folks who, who molded my love for science. Uh, who who got me into this sense that there was that you can go out and learn things about the world if you can apply a method to it, right? The scientific method. You can actually take hard questions and get and discover, right? That that seed of curiosity and exploration. Uh, that's what I learned from them, right? That this is and and then how to actually go about doing that. Um. So my best friends are authors. <laughs> um, I love reading. I read. I read. I read a lot, and uh, I'm really, I'm really inspired by people who take, again, sort of take science and try to make a difference with them. Adam Grant is one, who's a professor at Wharton, young psychologist, uh, wrote Give and Take, and his most recent book is Originals. Um, these are folks who are are challenging the orthodoxy of their profession, right? Um, he, Adam Grant is a kind of guy who's out there giving TED Talks, who's out there trying to promote, use science for the public good. And they, they think outside of what is expected of them and try to, um, try to make a difference by doing that at the risk Right of of their own reputation and and potential advancement in their careers, it, it, it's sort of people on the margins, right? Where what I've found over the years is that people who are the most innovative, who are who are pushing the envelope, they're always on the margins. They're always adjunct professors, right? Or they're always they, they're not they're not so embedded in a, in a system that in order to be successful, they have to kind of fit whatever that system tells them they need to be. They're kind of in between systems. Um, and, and those are always the people that I've, that I've seemed to gravitate toward uh, are people who don't quite fit in any yeah. system. <laughs> I love that you're bringing this up. There's, uh, there's, if, if you'll indulge me, I want to share a personal experience with uh, you and the listeners. Uh, ever since my interview with Nicholas Cole, I've uh, taken his advice and I've uh, been more active on Quora.com. And uh, one of the one of the articles that I wrote on Quora was about my own cancer journey and my my choice, my uh, deliberately uh, inspired choice, I will say, to forego traditional treatment of surgery and chemotherapy and to try. Uh, holistic treatment that was more of a whole body healing. And um, it's one of my more popular posts that I've done on Quora. It's gotten several thousand views and, and uh, uh, upvotes and comments. And not too long ago, this, uh, this gentleman pops up on the comment feed. It's a scientist from Australia and very aggressive, telling me that I'm, I'm leading people astray and that I'm offering hope when there is no hope to be offered and that the science doesn't back up my experience. And that if you look into the, the type of uh, therapy that I was writing about was called Gershon therapy. It's a, it's a, a, a brief description is you basically are taking into mind the alkaline acidic level of your body and you're eating things and allowing things in your body that make it more 
alkaline based than acidic base. And then there's some other toxin type of uh, remedies to help your body basically be in a better position to fight off toxin. And, uh, anyway, this, this guy is very pedantic and almost talking down to me about the way that he's writing. And I, I said, I, I asked him, I said, so do you think that the scientific community has a toehold on science? Because fact is a fact regardless of whatever community it came from and it kind of pissed him off actually that like i can't science is benevolent science is you know all these things why of course if there was another alternative to this of course we would tell the world and you know totally overlooking the 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 lobby of the medical industry and how cancer props it up and you know the treatments are super expensive and very profitable and all that notwithstanding and it was an interesting kind of moment for me as I, there was, there came a point where I just stopped bantering with him when I realized that there was no way for me to adjust his view. And it was just frustrating me by being a part of that. I was, you know, playing in the mud with the pigs, so to speak. But the epiphany that came after it was what helped me. It helped me to realize that, uh, and, and I have a question for you. The last question of this segment, I wanted to get your opinion on this, um, had to do with the definition of science and the definition of fact and um, is science in fact contextual or is it absolute? Um, I would say it's contextual. You know, I think blasphemer. Science. Just kidding. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Careful. These are the guys you're talking about. The adjunct <laughs> adventures, the guys in the fray. Like they would feel the same. It would seem. What 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 it is? So so there's like a spectrum. I think a continuum of sure. of how certain scientists are about different pieces of knowledge. Um, it's kind of like an onion, right? The outer layers of that onion are very much kind of we're feeling after them there's there's certain studies that are saying certain things and there may be other studies that are refuting that or, or they're or adding to that or maybe speaking to it in a different way and it's kind of sh- getting sh- you know taking shape still there are deeper layers of that onion depending on what area of science and and this is more true i think in 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 physics and in other areas that where the where the where we're relatively clear on on on, on a lot of things right um, and, and I think the same is true in psychology, right? There's, there's some, there's, there's enough, enough evidence that, that it seems like our knowledge is stable. Um, but if you talk to any scientist, science is a conversation. You know, I, 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 this, this idea that science has, quote, proven something, um, scientists don't think of it that way. They see it as there is evidence to suggest that X is the case, right? The data, what you always have are just data. You know, you do some, you do some study, you know, this, and then there's just data about some bump in, in some numbers that you're trying to measure based on some intervention or something you did. Um, how you interpret those data is always a debate amongst scientists, right? It, when you, when you, Think of like a, an actual scientific paper in the discussion section of it. Um, the scientists who are doing the studies will argue that X, that some some phenomenon or some effect is happening, right? Um, <clears throat> the, and it usually will co- correspond to the theory that they're building. Um, but you have other scientists in other labs who will disagree. They may not disagree with the data. You know, they'll believe that the data is done in integrity and almost it usually is. And not always. Occasionally there's scientific fraud. But but vast majority of the time, scientists are just, they really are after the facts, right? The truth. Um, but but you, there's, a, there's, 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 it's a conversation. And it goes back and forth and back and forth until we move closer and closer to, to um, a more stable understanding of a certain phenomenon. Seeing that this is the middle of the show, my hope is that you're finding some great value and insight from the conversation I'm having with my guest. We continue that here in a few in the second segment, but I felt a specific desire to share with you a powerful tool that may just be what you're looking for. Throughout my career, I've noticed that success leaves clues, and one of those clues is that all high-level achievers have a coach. Whether it be personal or business coaching, there is a huge value that comes from the direct 
personal connection and association of someone that can see your blind spots and help you expand past the limits of what you can do on your own. In case you didn't know, I offer both lifestyle coaching and business consulting to my clients. My introductory offering is a 12-week lifestyle expansion program where you and I work one-on-one to redesign your habits and priorities, making space for the life that you really want. It's comprehensive to the four tenets of rules of success, meaning we address your body, your relationships, your business, and your being. If you're ready to increase the results you experience in your life, head over to applythescience.com to see if it's a fit. So there it is. Coaching is a game changer. And if you'd like to know more about my introductory 12-week lifestyle expansion program, head over to applythescience.com. Again, that's applythescience.com. Now back to the show. All right, we're back. Second segment. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your story, James. The the interesting part about everything that you've said is is it's deliberate. I've I've wanted to share, you know, your progression uh, as far as your understanding of brain science and more specifically just in life. You know, you've had such an interesting you grew up in a, you know musically inclined household, went to BYU, transferred to Columbia, worked with uh, several very prestigious professors and and doing research specific to behavioral sciences and brain sciences and then you end up in Jordan working for the Peace Corps and then a nonprofit later on it was called Think Unlimited right Mm -hmm. and now here you are as the founder of Brain by Design so we talked about it being a platform and, and to help people transition let's let's dive deeper into that exact work so I want to know more about its birth though so how long has brain by design been an actual program um it's so it's only really been in existence for a few months okay Uh, so it's brand new i'm really in launch phase okay um and in terms of in terms of the idea for it it's been about 18 months in the making ever since we got home from jordan okay i've been working on it in the background so brain by design is it's obviously the name of your company and it's it's a is it a is it a teaching module is it a one-on-one experience is it what if i'm if i come to you and i want to work with you what do i get yeah yeah so i do do i do do private coaching in in executive coaching uh, on on that on a sort of one-on-one level um but but the signature program what we do it's a 12-week uh program Uh, it's called brain in mind um the next start date is january 25th uh, it's a once a week, so it's a webinar, it's web-based, so it's live, interactive. Uh, people will be on it asking questions, and it will be very um, uh, participant-based, we ask, you know, sure. in that way. Um, and it's 12 weeks, so it's so January 25th till, till April. Um, and that's really, so, so that's sort of like the, the easiest place to begin uh, it, this is sort of the foundation course. Sure. Um, you know, so so the way I see it is that brain and, be, brain and behavioral science, there has been a, a cognitive revolution in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, we know more about the brain, how brain and behavior work now. We know, there, there's like a, it's like a, it's like a growing wave of science in, in understanding that that uh, is finally really mature um and i think what's happened in the last decade or so is you have traditionally this area has sort of been the area of personal development and growth uh has been people in that space have been the sort of personal development in and sort of self-help uh movement or or, or industry um and now what what I see happening is that there's sort of a new uh, version of this, which is what I like to call science help. Um, and the reason this matters, I believe, is that there is, again, there's, there's a mountain of research and data and science around these same topics about how do we change? How do we form new habits? What does willpower look like? What, how does willpower act in our lives? Uh, what about the science of motivation, right? How do you actually harness and, and build the skill of self-motivation? Can you do that? Um, we talked about this earlier, right? Innovation, do, is it possible to build, quote, a skill set of innovation? Um, and the science on all of this stuff is emphatically yes. 
And underlying all of it is the science of neuroplasticity. Um, the word plastic or plasticity, we think of plastic as something that's hard, but in science what that means is malleable, that it's changeable. And, and essentially all that means is that our brains are way more dynamic. They, they work just like a muscle, right? You work them out, you exercise them in very specific ways, um, and they get stronger. Neurons grow new connections. You, you, you uh, form new neuro, neurons through a process called neurogenesis. Um, myelin sheath, the insulation along the, bo- the axon of the neuron gets thicker, right? So, so even just along those lines, uh, the speed at which a neuron fires can be as slow as two miles an hour. You insulate that enough times with what scientists call myelin sheath, which is essentially a fatty tissue, uh, can increase the speed of that firing to up to 200 miles an hour. So these, these differences are dramatic. And, How does um, that equate to real life thought and habit development, those increased speeds? Huh, we're still figuring that out. Okay. <laughs> I, I think the best way to think of it is, I, I think a guy like Michael Phelps, when he's doing the butterfly, those patterns are probably firing at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> Got it. Whereas mine are firing way lower. <laughs> um, but we don't really know yet uh, what that looks like. We, I think we experience it in conversation. We experience it in our own mind. You know, so it's not just the, the, the speed of, of cognition and thought. It's in relation to your body as well and how quickly your body responds to your brain. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I like to think of it. So... Your brain is sort of like a complex system of neural highways, freeways, and dirt roads. Yeah? Um, there are certain patterns that you drive on all the time. And if you were to look under a microscope, they would be healthy, strong patterns. Uh, you know, it's like a six-lane freeway, right? Or a sure. five-lane freeway. It's just, you can go up to 80 miles an hour on that thing. It's, you know, it, it's fast, it's efficient, it, it's the default of where you want to drive. There are other paths that are two-lane highways, right? You need to slow down a little bit. Maybe there's a little more traffic. It gets a little slowed down, but you can still drive on them. And then there are other things, like when you're trying to form a new habit, it feels a bit like you're driving down the freeway and you just literally pull off into the sagebrush. You know, you're going 80 miles an hour. What are you going to do? You're going to slow down to five miles an hour. You're bumping up and down rocks. It feels painful. Uh, you know, you're looking out for, th- this is what new habits feel like when you're forming them. They're hard. They're hard. But what's fascinating about the science around habit formation, you drive along that, <clears throat> that same path again and again. Eventually, you'll start laying down tire tracks. Eventually, you'll drive it enough, you'll sort of smooth it out to become a dirt road. And finally, your brain's going to be like, wow, well, he's serious. Let's, let's throw some resources at this thing. Let's pave that thing, right? Right. So let's do a two-lane do like two lane highway. And if you keep doing it, if you keep doing that behavior or action, eventually it'll be a five-lane freeway. So, so let me tell a personal story of my, my dad. My, uh, my dad is a exercise... Uh, he, he's like an automaton when it comes to exercise. He does it no matter where we are, vacation, at home, no matter what, he's always finding a way to exercise. And we all kind of know someone like this in our lives, right? You know, it's like, um, and we usually kind of resent them a little bit. We, we want to be them and we resent them at the same time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they either eat really healthy or they're super good at exercise or they're super disciplined and read all the time or they're really patient with their kids or they're really awesome time managers at work. And you ask them, how do you do it? You know, exercise for me, every time I do it, feels like a slog or it's hard or it's whatever. And they look at you and they're like, well, I don't know, I just kind of do it. And you're like, oh, I hate you even more. (laughs) Right? (laughs) You're like, what? You just, I'm asking for your secrets and you don't even know what your secrets are. And it's because they're driving on a six lane freeway. It's so well established that it literally hums in the background of their life. So there was a period in their life when it was hard for them at some point, 
right? And maybe they established that super early on, or maybe maybe there was a period in college or something where they got it so ingrained in the way that they run their life that they can't imagine their life without it. Right. And that unconscious mind is just scanning the environment for an opportunity to exercise every day. And so when they find it, if they're out of their, you know, in their daily routine, they just, it's like clockwork, but if they're on vacation or whatever, they'll, it's easy. It, it, so, so, so the science of habits is basically, it's hard on the front end. It's like, it's one of the most easy things to do on the back end because you don't right. think about it. Right. Habits run in the unconscious. And so, so it takes conscious effort or willpower to get them in place, but then eventually you push them back down into the unconscious and let them run on automatic. So how do you, how do you uh, increase the velocity of taking a desire and turning it into a habitual action? Secret sauce, right? Like that's the, that's the when whole When you say point, velocity, right? do you mean how fast to have yeah, it take ha- shape? Yeah, I... I you and I had discussed this at one point. I, there's a there's a, a falsehood going out that says it takes 21 days to yeah. create a habit. It's actually a lot longer than that, according to you, right? Yeah, the best research on this is that it's, on average, takes 66 days. 66 mm-hmm. days. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's that's the exercising of both willpower and discipline towards a specific action for basically two months and change. Mm-hmm. And how, how does the process of, how, how does the science of that you know, you, you use that example of, you know, a dirt road and, and sagebrush, and then it turns into a two lane and it can, you know, increasingly get easier and easier over time. Yeah. So is there any sort of tangible process that says, you know, on day 35, it's naturally going to be scientifically easier on your brain with the way that it works to do that same action, but it's still not a habit. Mm. And it's, it's more like an exponential curve that all of a sudden it reaches that, that 66th day and it's habitual is it or is it legitimately day 45 is just the same as day five until you, you know it, 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 it turns a point a very crisp direct like your brain knows this day finally it works or is it you know a, a, a increasing curve yeah so i'm going to talk about forming new habits not breaking old habits okay perfect um and in that case, um, I, I, partly I'm speaking from personal experience here. For me, it feels like um, it's taken on a life of its own. The, 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 one of the ways I kind of test this out for myself is if I were to, what would it feel like if I stopped doing this? And if it feels like my, my body or my mind is like, oh, like, oh, I can't not, I can't not live without this. I have, this is what I, just what I do. A, a good example is I started reading, uh, um, I, I came up with this sort of outlandish goal of reading a book a week in about uh, September of, of 2015. And I didn't, I didn't really think I could do it actually, because it was, you know, it's about 35 pages a day roughly, and it's a lot of reading. Um, and I didn't think I could do it, but I wanted to, cause I'd been so far off the wagon. I, I literally had only read, uh, <clears throat> the previous year I'd probably read, I think I'd read two books and maybe listened to two audiobooks. So, and, and I love, <laughs> I love reading. And so this is, I was like clearly out of alignment with what I love and what I value. Sure. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm going the distance on this one and it's going to be an ambitious goal. And, and I did, I set it. And I hit it on week one. I actually still remember the moment I finished my first book. It was called The Willpower Instinct. Uh, and it was late. It was like 12.30 a.m. on a Sunday night. And I did it. And I was like, oh my gosh, there it is. I can do it. Right? My self, what psychologists call self-efficacy, goes through the roof, which is my confidence level for if I can do it again. Yeah. Goes through the roof. And all of a sudden, it's like, boom, a new world. I can do this again. And I have. And, I, and I've read almost a book a week ever since. And, um, but it was hard. On the front end of that, it took me, because I consider this a very difficult habit, at least for me, uh, it took me almost exactly three months for that habit to feel securely in place. And the way I knew it, I had some relatives uh, in for the holidays, and... Um, 
And I remember thinking, oh, I've got to drop the reading habit this week because we're going to, you know, we're going to be doing all these activities and hanging out and whatever. I'm not going to have time. And then I woke up my normal time in the morning. And the first thing I do in the morning is read. And I thought to myself, well, what else am I going to do? <laughs> right? It's like, right. like, this is just what I do. It, and it felt like without it, I would be out of alignment. And then I was like, oh, it's in place. Now it's a habit. It's a habit. So again, that 66 days is an average. Easier habits might take a little bit less time. Harder habits might take a little bit more time. But, but on average, it's a little over two months. Interesting. Do you focus on this in your program? I do. I do. So, so think about it this way, right? Uh, Gretchen Rubin talks about habits are like the invisible architecture of our lives. So if you can master the science or the skill set of forming habits in your life, essentially you're mastering your own behavior and, what, and your own outcomes in your life. Uh, we all have these intentions. We always want to do certain things. Uh, maybe we go to a training and we learn some fascinating piece of knowledge or information. Um, and we would like to start doing that in our workflow, with our kids, with, you know, whatever it is. Um, but there's like a gap between intention and outcomes and the bridge that f- that of getting there to our, the actual outcomes we really desire, I believe is habits, is making that thing consistent and regular day in and day out. So for the program, um, it will be it will be the overarching theme of the entire program uh, is how to build and maintain positive habits. That is such a a need. It would seem in our world. Mm-hmm. I was thinking the entrepreneur community. Well, that too, and in the family life. Well, that too, in physical habits of you know fitness. Oh, that too. Like mm-hmm. there's really no no. Uh, blind spot where that isn't a necessity to learn. Mm. I know for myself, um, I, I recognize absolutely that willpower and discipline are exhaustible resources. Yes. And I've used this example before on this show, even about how it's kind of like rocket fuel. Like when you have that desire to change, it's like just highly combustible, lots mm. of energy, like, well, I'm going to do it. And then day two comes and you're just exhausted. Yeah. And there's got to be things in place that are with that. And, and I know for myself, one of the things that I've, implemented for my own habit creation, whatever it is, is processes that shift that decision from being this naked choice that's hanging in the wind mm. to kind of protect it underneath um, a scheduled time frame, to protect it underneath a, a, a prioritized whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, one of the easiest examples, you, you talked about your experience with reading a book and I'm pretty sure that if we were to dig into that with you, you talked about the morning time being a time that you read. Like there, mm. It became a norm that was protected, that it was what you did there while other things could have been being addressed but weren't, that that was your time. Yeah. You know, and that the same thing can be said. You know, every, everything about changes when it comes to your body and physical fitness is the same thing. Hmm. Pick a time that you're going to go to the gym. Pick Mm -hmm. a program you're going to follow when you're there. If you're willing to do those two things, you've done half the hard stuff. Like Mm. now all of a sudden you're mindless in the gym because you're there at a specific time Mm. and you know what you're going to do. If you don't have those two things up, you're going to wander in the gym. Should I run on the treadmill? Should I lift? Well, I'm out of here 10 minutes later. Exactly. And I love that your program addresses, you know, more than this. And, and, um, as we wrap this up, I'd, I'd like to ask you, what is, what is your ideal client? What, who's the person that could be helped the most from your program? So, so it feels to me like the biggest challenges most of us face are around stress and exhaustion. Um, and as well as falling short of what I think we're capable of, right? I think this goes for everybody, myself included. There is a version of me, there's a version of you, there's a version of all everybody out there listening that is a higher, better version of ourselves than the one that we currently are. And I think what I what I'm what the program is trying to do is introduce 
a handful of potential ways of doing things differently. Allowing the person to choose one of those things, right? We're going to go over multitasking versus monotasking, right? And multitasking is one of these things that drains energy. We're, we're, we make 50% more errors. It takes us twice as long to, to do things, but we're all doing it all the time right. because we're bombarded with technology. Um, we're going to go into the, the difference between n sort of nerd, the, the skill set of mindfulness and, and how to... Um, get literally into the driver's seat of your mind uh, around attention and, and being able to actually start directing that attention more more del deliberately and intentionally. Uh, even even around positive and negative emotions, right? I don't know if any of the listeners out there have ever seen, have, have kids and maybe have seen the movie Inside Out. What's so fascinating about that movie is that uh, you have joy mm -hmm. in the middle and you've got fear, disgust, anger right you you're like you're like oh you're like overwhelmed with negativity and you've got joy like holding on for dear life <laughs> that is exactly how our brains are wired scientists called negativity bias we are hardwired for negativity we pay attention to negative more it's just like amazon reviews right you look at amazon reviews you're like yeah five stars five stars five stars five stars yeah yeah, yeah. oh one star what did they say and we believe it more, right? We think it's more credible. It's more, right? Because we're hardwired to pay attention to negative information. That you can learn, you can train yourself to respond positively to negative and stressful situations. You can get curious, not frustrated, right? And this is what creative people do. This is what innovators and entrepreneurs, wonderful, brilliant entrepreneurs do is they, <clears throat> they do it, they actually really do do it differently. They run up against failure or a problem and they're like, oh, that really didn't go good. <laughs> like, fascinating. What went wrong? I'm so fat. And so their immediate response is to open up, to respond positively, where most of us narrow, it go into this negative emotional loop like, yeah. oh, freak like what did i do like why did i oh, i'm such a oh, I'm, I'm such a screw up whatever it is right um the, 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 there's a there's a suite of cognitive and emotional skills here that i believe is the difference between living your life again by design instead of by default right it's about it's about actually tapping into your greatest potential. We all live far below our potential. All of us. And the neuroscience is clear. There is so much more up here. Our brain is literally wired for transformation. It is built to rewire itself. And so you can learn how to put energy and effort into a particular behavior or task that you want to do better at. If you can kind of crack the code on that and become a, literally like a programmer of your own mind and your own brain, then you can do anything. Any behavior, any goal you care about. But, but you kind of have to understand the basics of how your brain works. Because it's with those basics that you'll be making wise choices about how to set up structures that will stack the deck for your success. I love it. We are, we're close to wrapping up here, James. Uh, where do people find you if they want to be a part of your program? And uh, even just to talk with you directly, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, you bet. So it's brainbydesign.com. Um, that's the best place. Uh, I've got a web, you got a Facebook page as well. Okay. Um, um, but that's there. Even my contact information is there, my email, my, my cell phone. Okay. Um, so, yeah, happy for anybody to reach out or to be a part of it. You guys know the drill. If you're listening to this on your phone, touch the image that says Rules of Success. It'll flip over, and you'll see the link for Brain by Design. It'll take you right to them. Um, fascinating conversation. You're a fascinating individual, James. Thank you so much for your time mm -hmm. and uh, sharing your expertise. I'm looking forward to hearing the success of your program and, and just the further evolution of that as you go forward. As you said, it is a relatively new program. Um, anything that we can do here, listeners, reach out to them. Fascinating stuff. When you add a, a scientific approach to self-development, it seems more centered. You know, one of my favorite mm. quotes that I recently came upon is, positive thinking is great, but not at the expense of critical thinking. Mm. And it seems like that this is a perfect combination of that, of the science and the hope of improvement. So 
appreciate your time on here and uh, go to brainbydesign.com guys. Thanks guys. Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Trent Outson, AKA Six Sense. Thanks for tuning in to the Rules of Success podcast. Next week, join us again for another ride. In the meantime, make sure to reach out to us on social media. To tweet our host directly, try at I am Mr. Prescott or check out our website at rulesofsuccess.us. Until next time, take it a day at a time.